Good afternoon. You're all very welcome uh, to this meeting of the Institute for International and European Affairs at the Irish Architectural Archive. Uh, we're very grateful to the Archive for hosting this meeting. Um, may, I, uh, may I suggest that to reduce uh, any of our embarrassments, you might put your telephone uh, to silent, please. The exits, there is an exit signed here, downstairs and um, across uh, out the way you, you entered, please. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the uh, Corporate Secretary of the Electricity Supply Board, uh, John Redmond, to say a few words uh, on behalf of the ESB. John. Thanks very much, John. Uh, all the same for you coming in that the uh, best sponsors of these events uh, are seen and not heard. So I'll keep this very short. It's a great event for me and for my many ESB colleagues to sponsor this event, Dan, and to welcome you to Dublin. Uh, we have the 18th century answer to the smart city right here. It's a beautiful building with that beautiful park. And we look very much forward to hearing your ideas about it. We know the work you're doing. You have been here in Cairo, in Jeddah, Great Lakes Project, uh, and in many other parts of the world. Thank you very much in, indeed, John. <laughs> Thank you. Um, today, um, we have a, a, a particular focus in, in the series. The ESB has been generously sponsoring a whole series of talks over, in recent years uh, at the IIEA. Um, today, uh, Dan Regelstein is going to talk to us uh, about smart cities for the 21st century. Uh, you might even see a new age of urban electrification. Um, Dan comes to us uh, from the uh, London practice of SOM. Um, he heads up their city design practice and directs uh, projects focusing on the urban regeneration of, of cities. Um, he, his educational background is at Harvard and MIT. Um, he has experience in an architectural and urban design practice in France. Um, he's been with uh, Skidmore and Smarrow since 1994. Um, became an associate in 97. He became a studio head for urban design and planning in Chicago in 98, an associate in 1999. And um, he arrived in this part of the world, I think, in 2003, um, where he heads urban design and planning. Um, and is now a director of it. So, so Dan, you're very welcome to Dublin, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. What's well, a pleasure to be here. Great, thanks for that. Um, humbled to be here. This is a, a great venue and a great topic, and uh, I already have met many of you at lunch earlier, um, and I've understood the, the passion that everyone already has on the topic of cities. So I'm going to focus more at the city scale of the discussion. Um, but again, this is more hopefully of a discussion uh, topic, a series of topic points that we can have a dialogue afterwards, please, by all means. So it's, it's great to be back here in Dublin. I, I know the city somewhat well, um, although I'm no, by no means uh, the experts that you all are of your place. But hopefully I'll make some interesting parallels. So the word electrification, um, I'm not trying to be funny here. I, I did have to look it up, because it's not a word we use very much in our, in our world. Um, so in doing so, you obviously find some anecdotes like this understanding that the first, first uh, city street that was electrified was the Avenue de Paris, uh, by the Opera, Avenue de, de Opera in, in Paris, um, which really transformed the whole uh, gas sector, I guess, uh, there. So maybe we're headed to a new kind of revolution. So of course, this is really about um, us getting off of getting cities and buildings and everyone else uh, off of fossil fuel energy and onto hopefully um, electricity, which can be much more sustainably sourced. That's the goal. We tend to focus more and discuss much more about carbon, carbon neutrality, carbon neutrality, of which, of course, renewable energy and electrification is really a strong component. Um, so we're at, at an amazing moment in history. And we have this incredible opportunity to reinvent how cities are re-emerging in the world. Uh, we know more and more people are, are, are moving into cities, and obviously the 
population of the world is growing. Um, but the reality is our planet is facing some pretty huge challenges. Um, population growth, um, kind of acute, acute things that are happening with the climate um, and climate change, sort of the loss of natural environment and also the tremendous amount of natural resources that, that we're all using. Uh, in some countries, up to five times the, their proportion of what the planet can give. So we really have to sort of correct these, these trends. So I think we're seeing in the, in the professions of architecture and city planning um, that we're in a, in a new state of transition. We are trying to understand these, these, these global forces and trying to find ways to collaborate much more to, to address these challenges. Um, so we, we really do need to look, I think, at the scale of the region and the city to solve a lot of these problems. So I've challenged myself, actually, um, when I was asked to give this talk to answer a few questions. Um, so I won't read these now. We'll go through them sort of one by one as we go through. But it's really also questions to you all as well to please uh, enter into this dialogue. By no means do I have any or all the answers. Uh, to give you a bit of context, I thought I would describe who we are at SOM, um, both particularly in the city design practice and firm-wide. Um, so we are, in the city design practice, about 150 people that work around the globe. We do um, share our stories and our, and our uh, sort of uh, yeah, challenges uh, quite regularly, almost on a weekly basis. And we just got together our yearly conference in September. So we're sharing these interests. We're architects, landscape architects, urban planners, policy, um, policy planners that really are trying to come together to think at the larger scale. But we are well known for... <coughs> for delivering not only just master plans and reports, but also delivering those things in real life projects around the world in very complex, scalable size. We're also very passionate about the environment. You'll see that hopefully in our work. Um, so as you mentioned, we, we have been looking at the largest scale. This was um, part of the, the Burnham um, anniversary in Chicago. We started as, as a pro bono exercise. We started looking at the Great Lakes, the watershed, without any boundaries. Um, understanding the, the natural environment, understanding the watershed um, from a geological and ecological point of view, and looking at how to create partnerships across these boundaries to look at the future of the Great Lakes region, which actually provides, it's actually 25% of the world's freshwater resource and over 40% of the, of, the, of the North America's freshwater um, that's used. And it's glacial water that will never go, that can never come back. So looking at large scale strategies for how to protect that environment and also get people to work more together. Recognize it as, as a system um, across boundaries. Of course, we're also heavily involved in large scale district master planning. We were um, brought to really London to work on the Broadgate and Canary Wharf projects. We've been involved in Canary Wharf for the past 30 years um, with that long term client. Um, we're also focused on transit-centered ur urbanism. So this is a recent project in Philadelphia on the western side of the city around the rail interchanges that exist there today, re-envisaging a higher density development as high-speed rail hopefully comes to the northeast coast. Um, it would come here. And this would also link to University of Pennsylvania and Drexel University to create a new innovation district around this transport interchange. So that, that plan's just been approved. And we'll now start to move forward in a public-private partnership with developers in the city and the, and the regional rail authorities. We're highly focused on urban regeneration, um, embracing historic patterns of development, existing communities, revitalizing, refreshing, and having a community dialogue for how the future of their neighborhoods can, can go forward to embrace uh, um, you know, modern development. We're very interested in, uh, in livability, livability in an urban place and at higher densities. And so how, what are the things we, we need for that? We talked uh, at lunch earlier about this. It's, it's schools, but it's also about great public places and comfortable, safe, secure places for families to live if we really want people to, to live in more dense urban areas. We've also been involved in some sort of think pieces, or this is a weekend workshop with the City of London to look at and hack the city cluster. And this was about understanding, with some help of other experts who have these great modeling techniques to, to measure um, the dynamics that are taking place, for example, in the city cluster to not only look at the effects of wind, but also measure thermal comfort. How can we add different layers to our modeling to understand if these places are going to be viable places to dwell, not just move through? I'll show you about that later. And we're also working at the larger scale the same sort of issues, using dynamic computer modeling to help us form new cities. So this is a new city in China. We're working with the government in Chengdu around a new airport. And this was really modeling different scenarios of city form to ensure that there was fresh, fresh air 
being breathed through the development over the long term. And through modeling, we're able to improve, obviously, air quality is a really key issue in China right now. Um, so making sure that the, there's enough flushing of fresh air through the development, that really helped form the plan, not some idea from outer space of a formal geometry. It's really an environmental modeling that's helping form the city. As I said, we're also very passionate about the landscape and nature and the native environment. So in our strategies, like the one in Chicago for the, through the river, bringing back um, this industrial waterway into a more cleanly environment can become amenity for people, not only who work there, but who will live there. Um, so revitalizing this riverfront is already taking place for the last about 20, 25 years, and just extending that, that strategy further in. Obviously, from the, the built form architectural side, um, which our practice really is uh, an architectural-led architectural -led design practice, but we are multidisciplinary as well with structural engineering, environmental engineering, sustainability, et cetera, really pushing the envelope with high-performance design, ensuring efficiencies, and um, minimizing demand. This is one of our most sustainable recent buildings in Geneva. Uh, all glass building, but it's a quilted facade, so it's actually tilting the glass away from the sun to help reduce the energy um, that, that, the, that, the, that will come into the building or that the building demands. We're also talking much more in the profession now about well-being and people-centric design. This is really important for uh, the younger generations that are looking for these kinds of great places to, to live and work in cities. Um, this is a recycling of a building in Milan, um, where Allianz used to have their headquarters. So it's repurposing, for example, the interior parking courtyard and the below-grade parking structure to create this great amenity for employees, a mixed-use sort of uh, open environment that people can kind of mix and mingle, and also bringing landscape and, and green space in. That's <coughs> doing a lot of research with partner institutions as well. This is a, a green wall that we've now built and installed. Um, this is with uh, Rensselaer Polytech Institute, um, who's actually shared space with us in our New York office. Develop this uh, potential new system which would help recycle air internally within a building through, um, through native plants um, to help cleanse the air before it gets put, put back into the space. I think we're also seeing, um, I'm encouraged, even our, all of our architects are now thinking much more about the city than ever before. How does the building connect to the place? whether it be for workplace, environment, housing, or in this case, a school in New York, really linking the circulation space of the school and its main collaborative spaces to its neighboring environment. So that's, I think, a positive shift that's going on, recognition that cities really are this dynamic place. So just before I get to the, some of the key questions, maybe just a bit of background about you know, cities today and tomorrow. Um, I think cities are very complex, organic, things. They're multi-layered. They're very diverse and things have happened over time for many reasons, not just for physical infrastructure reasons. There's many different lenses we need to look through when we look at cities in terms of the, the structures, not just of roads and of infrastructure and, and buildings, but also the social infrastructure, the cultural history, the natural environment, the economic reasons for things that are happening and taking place. So it's, it's a very difficult element to unwind, and we need lots of help. We can't see, see it as ourselves as a city planner or as a city architect or as a architect of a building having all the answers. We all need to work together. Obviously, I think the Industrial Revolution had a major impact on cities. This is not arguable. <laughs> this is pretty clear. I mean, London, you can see how the growth of London was impacted exponentially when the, the turn of the Industrial Revolution came on board, but it also had a huge impact on the, not only physical infrastructure, but the social infrastructure of places. So I think we're all sensing now is the time for, the, for a new revolution. We're seeing it in terms of information uh, for the Industrial Revolution, but we see it as a need to think of it as a new uh, revolution for cities that moves, moves us away from fossil fuels and into much more livable, um, inviting, and more meaningful environments. Um, in doing this research, some of the statistics we, my team found were quite shocking to me as well. I mean, obviously, we understand that built environments have an impact on health and well-being, but to this state, I had no idea, really, that it, that's affecting this much about our future health of a human race is really uh, critical to understand. Obviously, air pollution is one of the major, uh, major um, issues. And again, this for me is quite shocking that this is, it was the number one uh, cause of premature mortality in the world, um, almost 7 million deaths. I guess that's more than cancer. That's quite surprising to me. Um, so it does sort of put the urgency forward here very quickly in your mind. 
Um, so thinking more positively, I think our thesis, I think all of us would agree that a smarter and cleaner city really is the bright future. And this is, has the opportunity to become the new revolution. We're seeing it already happening in many places. Um, Singapore is a, is, a great, is a great model um, for one. And hopefully other good things will come out of Singapore this week, won't they? Um, <laughs> we shall see. Um, so obviously the world is growing. Um, it's growing very quickly. It's going to be incredibly uh, dense. And we know that uh, most of these people are moving to cities. So that is our challenge. And I think you're seeing it here in Dublin as well. I'm not sure sure this statistic is accurate, but you're growing proportionally very, uh, very quickly, and you have good reason to, obviously, with what's happening with Brexit and whatnot, but it's a similar growth pattern that we're seeing seen in London and other major cities around the world. Um, so that this, there may be a small number uh, for other people to think, but I'm sure proportionally is quite big for you to kind of get your heads around. Um, so we also found this interesting uh, piece of information that over the next two decades only, 80 billion square meters of development and buildings will be constructed in urban areas worldwide. So how, how big is that? Well, it's more than half of the entire stock of built forming in, in the world. That's as much as building, rebuilding, building and rebuilding New York City every 35 days. So that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Hopefully it's a good thing. It's massive changes happening, but it's got to be positive change. So we really do hold the, our own features in our own hands. Um, you know, urban environments really do um, consume you know, three quarters of the world's uh, natural resources, so it's really critical we get this right. And of course, I think everyone knows that more than three quarters of uh, carbon emissions comes from cities. But I wanted to break that down a bit. I was asking Ed Mazaria in the States, he's heads up the uh, AIA's 2030 challenge. Um, and he was in the office in Chicago when I happened to be there, we had this little workshop as I was asking him, so Ed, can you break this down for me? Because everyone's talking about building sustainability and how we have to be green, build, every building's gonna be green, and what impact would that really have? So we mapped this out together um, with him, and then we sort of then research it further to develop it further. So buildings only occupy a small piece of that territory. When you look at that, that donut, yes, of course, three quarters is sort of built environment focused, but there's a big piece there related to transportation, which I'll talk about, uh, and then energy production, and obviously industry. Um, so I think we got to have a global context here that it's not just about the architectural built form, it's, it's about lots of things coming together that we have to address. So based on that piece of the pie on electricity, so uh, energy production, let's say, so what countries and cities are really leading the way to trans get, get, get us off of fossil fuels? Well, surprisingly, I found this surprising. Germany is ahead of the game and um, from a country that has a lot of coal-powered uh, plants, They've already gotten to that one-third of their energy production's sourced renewably as of last year. So that's, that's fantastic. They always have been, so I would say, advanced in terms of pushing forward uh, recycling and green initiatives. And they are looking to get to 80% minimum uh, by 2050. Um, you all here are committed to uh, sustainable energy sources, and maybe these numbers are under under providing what I've heard this, what I heard at lunch earlier, so that there's this great uh, impetus for t creating change here in Ireland as well. And it's, again, it's not about one thing, it's, it's a series of things that are gonna help get you to that, that, that goal of, which we found to be 16% in just, just two years time. Um, Paris is moving forward, and this is maybe not as about energy production, but it's related. Um, so they are looking to banish all petrol and diesel fueled vehicles by 2030, and Macron just announced a couple years ago, a couple months ago, that uh, the entire country is gonna stop selling, allow the sell of gas and diesel powered uh, vehicles by 2040. That was astonishing to me that uh, the French government was able to take that initiative, particularly since all their major car companies are primarily state-owned. So maybe they, they, can, they can inflict that upon the, their, their car companies better, better than maybe the United States can. So um, good news, there's over 40% of cities um, in the world that are actually operating under, um, I think it's 40 cities, 40, not 40%, there are 40 cities, not 40% of cities, currently operating at 100% renewable energy. Um, so there's Burlington and Vermont, these are small cities, Basel uh, and Reykjavik. Reykjavik, I think, benefits from having tremendous geothermal deposits below, but that's good news, that things are actually moving in the right direction. The UK, um, 80, 80 towns and cities have signed up to run uh, clean energy by 2050. 
And these are including some of the major cities and some of the major boroughs in London. Um, so how much can electrification affect the city's performance? And how do we get us off of this uh, sort of moving from dependence from diesel, which is everywhere, you'll see in a minute, um, to, to more freedom through electricity? I think we also have to be careful. So moving to electricity is a great thing, but only if the energy source is as clean as we'd like it to be. If we're moving everything off to electric, but the electricity is still being generated from these fossil fuels and natural gas or, or coal-fired plants, we really haven't done much, uh, as, a, as a other donut showed before. So we really need to work at the upstream provision of electricity, not just the systems and, and the downstream side. Also, the, the story has to be discussed about not only, not only what type of energy we're using, but where is it being produced, and where are the sources, of the, where is it being used? Um, so in the US, there was, in 2013, 20 billion kilowatt hours were lost just in, just in transmission across the lines which could have, been, could have powered almost two million um, si regular sized American homes for one year. So moving you know, renewable energy sources closer to the place that's gonna be used as key, and therefore we're talking about compact cities, the need to have a compact development, which also talks to livability. The most livable cities that constantly get on that livable cities index in the world are really compact cities, uh, not necessarily uber dense like Hong Kong, but compact urban environments. Um, Melbourne's been on the top, top, top of the list for the past seven years running. So it has mul mul multiple benefits, uh, not only moving things closer to and making things more compact, it, it will also make things more livable. So an example of, of moving energy production and use to the source, this is a, a pilot project we did, we are in the middle of doing with the US Department of Energy and Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the University of Tennessee. And this was a um, a building, a little, little pod of a building that was 3D printed and it was trading energy with a Jeep that was also 3D printed. And the idea is to see how that could work at a small scale and then scale it up over time. So this project was really about reducing carbon in cities, not just pr promoting renewable um, energy production. So it was about you know, eliminating waste, uh, 3D, 3D printing buildings. We can also recycle that material. Um, and. Um, having the shared integrated energy between sources. So here's the, the it was a, it's the biggest seat, well maybe, maybe not any longer, but a couple years ago it was the largest 3D printer in the world being done at the, at the lab. We created this series of C-sections which were then assembled into these rings. And then the rings then became assembled together to create this pavilion, and, uh, which is now built and sits on the campus of the School of Architecture at the University of Tennessee. And it's meant to be uh, a pod for living in, actually. Uh, so it has a kitchen, the kitchen folds up and it becomes a bedroom. Um, and it's really meant to be uh, sort of a showcase for how this, how this building could produce its own electricity and trade it with the vehicle. And so the uh, Oak Ridge, other group of scientists at Oak Ridge actually developed the Jeep in, th in 3D printing, I guess everything except for the tires. Um, and this energy is being transferred, so the Jeep drives around the city, generates energy, gives it back to the building. The building also captures solar energy from its, uh, from its PVs on the roof and it gives it energy back to the Jeep. They've even uh, are developing now the wireless transfer of the energy, so it doesn't have to be plugged into one another. So that was just the, the first year of a five-year program, and now the next step is to scale it up. So obviously this is very applicable for remote areas or for, let's say, um, conditions where you have to address a crisis. This could be a really great solution for that. Um, but the next challenge is to bring it up to a city scale, and, and how, how can that be done? So, the researchers are now beginning to work on ideas of prefabricating pods that then can be brought in to be, be assembled into a building at a larger scale, almost like a shipping container, or um, like a flat pack, like a, like a piece of IKEA furniture that you, you have individual components that are printed um, and then assembled into uh, a building. And uh, it doesn't have to be repetitive, monotonous, and terrible looking. It could be quite interesting. It could actually be quite a challenge to architects to create an interesting built form out of that very simple system. So that's where that, uh, that study is headed. So um, what cities are moving forward in terms of electrification of transport? So I, I, many of you have probably seen this diagram, which is the, the profile of energy production and use in the European Union. On the left-hand side, you have all the different colors of energy use. The poor renewable strand is the tiny little green 
spaghetti you see in the middle, uh, completely, totally dominated by natural gas and, um, and fossil fuel oil production. The reason I show this is that on the right-hand side, the biggest user of that fossil fuel energy is transportation in the, in the EU. So uh, if we can uh, tackle that, we've tackled a huge proportion of that, uh, of that issue. So, um, but the news isn't great in Europe. Um, nine out of 10 of our buses are still operating on fossil fuel energy, so only one in, one in, one in 10 are green, and not that, most of those are also hybrid, not electric. Um, so there's a ways to go there. Um, obviously, cities are now signing up, and bus companies are signing up to transform their stock into more renewable and electric uh, sourced buses. In London, all, this, all the single layer buses are moving towards uh, zero exhaust emissions by 2020 double-deckers um, a bit earlier, um, but that'll take, that'll take time, and today it's less than, I think, 2% of the entire fleet of buses in London, so, so quite a bit ways to go there. So the city that gets the gold star on this right now is Shenzhen. They, they've actually, a year early than, than planned, they've, they've transformed the entire fleet, which is you know, 16,000 buses, which is more than London's 9,000, more than New York's 6,000 or so, and in this period of two years, they've transformed their uh, e emissions and their air quality to meet their target, their 2020 target, two years early. Um, so this is phenomenal that they've been able to pull that off. And just that one change has changed the entire complexity, complexion of, their, of their, um, the, air, the air quality of their city. So the rest of the world has a ways to go. So what are the benefits of embracing new technologies at the scale of a city? It's interesting to embrace it in our telephones and our buildings, but what about at the larger scale? Um, so I guess this brings us to the topic of what makes a smart city. I think the, uh, unfortunately, the IT companies have jumped to that term and have won, won the race to take ownership of that, uh, which is a bit disappointing for us. For us, smart city is much more than just about IT layer of the city. Um, so, but it is about making sure that this data um, that we're, we're getting more and more of every day, which is almost impossible to, man to manage in some ways, it, how do we make it more usable and more, uh, more custom user friendly to the everyday person living and working in a city? So we're really promoting ideas of, within our developments, starting first at a smaller scale to uh, create these development apps that allow people who live in those communities, work in those communities to understand the dynamics of their energy use uh, at a community scale. Um, to sort of inform what they're doing, to make decisions. Maybe they, they, they take that one extra car trip out of their, their weekly journeys and they change it to something else, cycling or walking. So it's about awareness, but in a way that's very user-friendly, like we're all used to seeing on our, on our computers and our phones. But also using technology to grab and create community, to let a community grow and change over time, to connect to other people, and to bring on events and other, other initiatives that can help them um, create a more sustainable future. So, I mean, in summary, the smart city topic, it's not just about electricity, it's not just about smart IT, it's really holistic, and we have to hit all these things. It's, so it's not, it's not sexy, it's not easy, it's complex, it's requiring lots of different um, experts, but to really deliver a smart city and smart growth, we have to address all these things. And technology can't help us in doing that. So will electrification help reduce a city's energy demand uh, or bring on better efficiencies? Or will it just mean we'll, we'll, we'll just use more of the same electricity we have in different ways? I think I would like to argue technology can be a beautiful thing. Obviously, we don't have to search long and hard in these kinds of archaic filing systems to find information anymore. We have it readily accessible at our fingertips, but that does mean we're drawing more on the grid to do those things. So uh, as we become more advanced technology and energy becomes more efficient, my question really is, do, will, we, will we actually become more energy, energy hungry than we already are? I mean, the good news is a lot of our equipment and uh, facilities are much more energy efficient, so we have lights that turn themselves off when we leave the room, um, et cetera, and, 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 and appliances at home that are being much more energy conscious. So that's helping to reduce the demand, even though we're using much, much more electronics, let's say. But to me, that's, that's kind of a question. So how can we embrace this technology and sustainable future in a, in a more enduring way? I mean, buildings definitely have a role to play, um, and they need to be able to uh, create energy, not just, just sort of use it and sometimes even waste it. So this is a project that's just been completed in New York for a new primary school. It's a zero energy primary school, which I think is kind of cool because it's actually teaching the younger generation 
what their school is doing from an energy point of view. They actually go into their kitchen and they understand that when they're making something that it's creating energy, or they run a play cycle in their, in their playground is actually showing them how many uh, kilowatt hours they're helping to produce for their own school. So it's all tied to the energy of the school. So it's a great sort of educational tool, which is really also pretty key. At a larger scale, we're working ironically with um, Indonesia's largest um, petrochemical and oil company, Pertamina, for the new headquarters building, and they really saw this as a flagship for a zero energy tower. Um, they benefit being on the Ring of Fire, obviously, and the Pacific, so we found the ability to go down about two and a half, three kilometers to get down to geothermal um, sources that can actually be used not only to heat and cool the building, but also to turn a turbine to generate electricity. And that electricity generation can almost power this 500 meter tall tower. Not entirely 100%, so we also have to still add in wind turbines at the top and uh, photovoltaics down at the ground. Um, but there is a great opportunity to think about geothermal around the world in the right places. There are examples in Europe. Uh, we found some in Berlin, uh, in, um, in Germany, um, where it's, it's not too far to go down. And these aren't big pieces of kit and the, the, the cost turnaround isn't that, isn't that bad. So we should be looking much more at geothermal and obviously for those cities that are on the edges of, of waterfronts using um, sort of water-based technologies. But no individual building should be seen as an island and in isolation. It's a project we're doing in Paris uh, for the Grand, Grand Paris Management and the local town of Charenton and a developer. Um, of course, it has a tall tower as iconic structure to be emblematic of this district, but it's tied to a much wider uh, new urban district as well of low scale sort of Parisian scale buildings. And we're looking at this as an opportunity to create a more dynamic uh, system, a district wide system of sustainable networks, both recycling water and waste and energy demand and energy use, uh, where the buildings, particularly between residential and office buildings can trade energy at different times of the day, different times of the, of the week. Um, so there are things you can do at a larger scale, you can't do at a building scale, which are really important to embrace. So um, moving towards the last couple questions. So we were talking a lot about this at lunch, about um, the future of, of travel, and what is, what is potentially the impact on city form over time as we become less dependent on fossil fuels. So we, we were talking about this a lot at lunch, about what is the future of the autonomous vehicle um, soon, it, it could be everywhere. I think from a design profession point of view, we're probably a bit behind the auto, automobile makers and some of the transportation and tech companies uh, dealing with this issue. Um, I would hate for it to become what this image is kind of implying, which is a private luxury limousine that allows you to move about the city on your own, where you don't socialize with anybody and you're able to read a book or work on your laptop in a more efficient way than if you were stuck in traffic for an hour or two but I fear that could be the danger, particularly in more sprawling cities, in cities where the, the personal vehicle is sort of rules the day, cities like Houston and Los Angeles. Um, and we have to be careful not to end up on the right-hand side of this slide. We, we really need to be pushing the left-hand side um, where we're, we're creating more shared opportunities for vehicles, um, so sharing that singular vehicle or getting vehicles a bit bigger to share them uh, while they're traveling the same distance. So I think the first, first route and the first opportunity is, is for the taxi system. The taxi system is a shared vehicle. It's the same vehicle that is shared by many people throughout the day. I was just in the, the, the electric London taxi of the day. It's, it's fantastic. So it's, if we can get those vehicles, types of vehicles first to be electrified, um, it's very comfortable, very quiet. Um, that's a, a tremendous first step. But I think the real answer in our more urban areas, and maybe even suburban areas, which we were also discussing earlier, um, is sort of the microtransit system, that it's about you know, four to five, maybe 10 people in a vehicle that sort of create the, fill the gap between um, the metro systems, the, the mass transit systems, and maybe the, the, the last mile of travel. And you can link that to, to, to biking and walking um, and create a much more dynamic system. And so these kinds of things we're seeing popping up, um, and those maybe have the best opportunities for the series of minivans that are moving around, not just taxis. So how are cities getting ready for the autonomous vehicle? Where do they see these things benefiting their environments? This was a survey, I think, of US cities. And the good news here is the majority, it's very small tech, sorry. The majority of them are thinking about them as sort of last mile transit vehicles, as a thing, as I was just saying, to plug into the wider network and be coordinated. So last mile transit, taxis, 
mass transit, those are the top of the list. Cities are also thinking about them in terms of moving goods around. Um, uh, the City of London is thinking about this as well in terms of central, cent central, um, centrally locating all deliveries, let's say Amazon. They get a barge in the river. There's a study to look at a barge in the river. From that point, you have a series of robots that deliver goods throughout. Or they're going to force companies to move their deliveries to their employees' homes because there's just too much white van traffic in the city happening today. I do, I do think that we have to be careful about who's going to be scripting these future visions. If it's left to the car companies, as this image comes from, um, I find it a bit scary, and they really haven't created a better city environment. It's really just, again, big roads. People are segregated from the roads. All these flyovers. Uh, I don't see that as being a better environment for us as people. Maybe it's better for them and their cars, but not for us as people. So I think we need to engage many people together to solve this. Um, uh, this is an answer, but I think this is heading in the right direction. This is uh, an idea uh, we, we brought forth in New York City, which is re-envisioning the, um, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway into a autonomous vehicle superhighway. So that would be the long distance travel transit, which then frees up the ground plane, which today is a street, uh, to create much more local neighborhood space. It could provide other forms of transit, local transit, than the, sort of the mass transit above. And, and better landscaping and people places in the middle of uh, a dense urban environment. So I think we need to get architects involved, landscape architects involved, um, not just the, the car manufacturers that are delivering the vehicles. We've been working again with the City of London on this, uh, an idea for the, for the square mile, uh, and looking at and analyzing the, the major transit routes in the city, the, c the center of the city center. Um, these red routes are used by buses, by service vehicles, and by pedestrians coming out of the rail stations to move to their place of work. So we are envisaging an, op an idea that you stop all this transit at the perimeter, outside the square mile, and that you use a, a, the system of microtransit to create the last mile um, journey. And that could be combined with walking as well as these micropods. And the cities would be pretty conducive for these smaller vehicles because it is very circuitous. It's not a North American grid, obviously, uh, sort of medieval in character. So these smaller vehicles could navigate the tight turns and things. So that could be a, uh, an opportunity to, to move more people around and spread them across many more routes than just the major ones where they've got conflict with most traffic. And that could also be teamed with a green strategy for the city. So you could have wayfinding through green up certain parts of the city. Um, not necessarily having to dig up a lot of uh, the streets, just putting some trees and planters and, and making that sort of part of the wayfinding and sort of improving the quality of, of, uh, of air, air as well. So getting back to the question, um, we're debating this too. What, what is the future form and shape of the city? It's one thing about retrofitting existing cities, but other new city environments, how, how are they going to be formed? In the past, obviously, uh, cities were formed by a man and his mule, probably taking his... Uh, things to market, uh, which created this kind of medieval um, city pattern. After the Industrial Revolution, we got a bit more efficient. We began to align development along corridors that mirrored the transportation corridors. And where the corridors crossed, we created intensity of development. Um, so that was really, you know, something was determined by the wire or by the, the rail on which those vehicles ran. So are we talking now about something that's much more diverse again? Because these little robots with people in them can travel anywhere in a customized fashion. So are we moving towards a model where it's even much more polycentric than before? Question. Could be interesting. Um, much more, much more, it could be much more diverse, much more polycentric. It could be more alienating because you may not ever see anybody else on your journey. <laughs> um, I'd hate to see that what happens is the LA kind of model where things, cities just get, because you can do that, cities just continue to sprawl further. Hopefully, it's more like a model like Dublin, I would say. I, I put Barcelona, but I could have put Dublin, the center of Dublin. Hopefully, that's more of a human scale urbanity that allows this sort of incredible mobility in multiple directions, but it's still at a sort of urban scale that densifies and makes things compact and livable. So that's, I think, kind of our big question that we're all sort of scratching our heads, particularly when we're working in new city environments. We're working in new cities in Africa and the Middle East, China, as I mentioned. These are the kinds of questions we're asking ourselves. What, what form does the city need to take to, uh, as these new, new mode of transport happens? That's going to be the next debate, I think, over the next 20, 30 years. So just to, just to summarize, um, 
is electrification the big silver bullet um, to reduce our carbon footprint? I think by now the answer for me is kind of obvious. The answer is no. It's much more complex. Cities are multi-layered things. They're, they have many different systems um, and needed different layers of expertise. You have energy as one of those key layers, obviously, in electrification, but you have you know, rainwater and storm matter management, stormwater management, you have resiliency issues, community infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we've always been talking about a suite of things that you have to put together with electrical um, strategies to actually get to a carbon neutral future. Um, interesting uh, anecdote, when you, when you look at taking fossil fuel production away from, car, from um, coal plants, you're also going to reduce the amount of water demand because those coal coal-fired plants require a lot of water. So that would help in that. So again, thinking more holistically, there's many things that we have to address, not just the, one, one of those things in that wheel. And again, just underlining the, the, the issues of, of making sure these places are wonderful places to live and work, bring people together, um, connected with nature, dealing with resiliency, but also allowing things to evolve and change over time, um, as our cities have been able to do in the past, and creating comfort uh, on the ground, within buildings, to making sure these things are, are relevant. Um, making the invisible visible. Again, educating people about what's happening, what, the, what their daily impact is on the grid or on a city, on their services, on their infrastructure. But let's also keep in mind the kind of places we're going to end up creating. Um, we don't want a city full of roads with fast-moving silent vehicles that could actually be, could be quite dangerous if we're not careful. Uh, are these, some, of these, some of these vehicles so quiet that we create new conflicts we hadn't imagined before. Obviously, we'll clean up the air, but um, it, you have to think about these other conflicts. And again, I think it's, we yeah, always have to keep in the back of our mind, it's always, always about the people. And ourselves as human beings coming together in these urban environments, that's what creates cities in the first place. That's why cities will survive in the future, because there will always be this desire to bring people together. And so we have to keep that in the back of our mind, not always just the, the, the system. Thank you. <laughs>